All right, and we are live, hopefully. Uh, I always do a bit where I just sort of wait for a couple minutes to make sure that everything does what I think it does. So just gonna stall for a little bit. Yay, excellent. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you're all having a better morning than I am. Oh, hello from Pluto. I, I doubt this somehow. Uh, Brazil, Chicago, Peru, Brazil. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, sorry we were a little bit late getting started. I, I threw out my back this morning. <laughs> I just like, I got up this morning, I was like, mm, beautiful day, big stretch. Uh, and then my back went twing. And um, yeah, so I've been dealing with that. I've got some ibuprofen, and I got a hot water bottle. I should be, should be fine. Uh, Tehran, Prague, Brazil, Pitt. Oh, everybody's from around the world. Um, welcome, 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 welcome. Today, we are gonna be talking about automated data pipelines. It's the first day of the event. Um, and the first day is going to be probably the most controversial one um, because we're going to be talking about data version. Uh, Jeff says, don't throw it out, keep it. Okay, I guess I will. Um, it's just a, it's an expression that means I have a, have a muscle spasm. Um, yes, so today we're going to be talking about uh, data pipelines and data versioning, and then we're going to create a Kaggle data set from a GitHub repo. Um, so, and I'm, I am not in, in, I'm not in pain anymore. The, uh, the painkillers have kicked in. So, so uh, one comment that I got after the uh, last session was that people would prefer that I save questions till the end. So what I have done is I have gotten a little a uh, notepad and a piece of paper, and I will jot down questions as you guys ask them, uh, and then we'll go back and talk about them at the end, unless I think it's super relevant. Um, starting out, data versioning. Uh, Rajdeep says, how long will it be? This is a relevant question. Um, I am hoping for like 20 minutes, under 20 minutes, um, for just like the content and then questions at the end. Okay, so... Uh, you might be familiar with versioning from code versioning um, and uh, version control. Um, someone says number of days in the series, it is three. So uh, day one, we're going to talk about versioning GitHub. Day two, we're going to talk about data validation and um, creating data sets from URL endpoints. And then day three, we're going to talk about EDL pipelines um, and the creating data sets from kernels. So doing like a little, a little mini ETL pipeline on, um, on Kaggle. Okay. Um, right. So you might already be familiar with versioning from working with version control or source control. Um, oh, and question, what are we trying to achieve with the pipelines tutorial? So uh, I want to, this is really aimed at data scientists to sort of get an idea of some of the best practices around creating pipelines that connect code and data together so that you can run them all at once and um, exploring some of the best practices there and also getting a little bit of, of uh, practice as well. Yeah. Okay. So versioning, um, version control and source control is really common when working with code. Um, and it's less common when working with data specifically. Um, and there are some really good reasons for this. Um, so one of the, the big problems with trying to plug data into existing version control or source control like GitHub or the other ones that people use, um, there's one that Atlassian does that I'm trying to remember the name of. Anyway, the other one, if you know, just put it in the chat. Um, and if you try to add data files with to these existing source control um, you know, infrastructures, you will make it less useful. Bitbucket, thank you, Darren. Uh, <laughs> everyone else knew. Um, 
you will make it less useful because they're designed to compare code files to each other uh, and to um, allow you to see any edits that you've made between versions and every edit that you've made and the line where it was, right? So the good thing about that with code is that you do actually want to see all of those changes with your eyes. If you are changing a data file, you probably don't actually want to see all of those changes with your eyes, right? So if I've added a hundred new cases, I don't necessarily need to look at each of those cases, right? Um, I would want to see if I added a new column, that's information that's very important and is gonna affect things I'm doing downstream, but just changing the amount of data um, or maybe like removing something because you're, you're you know, someone has had a, um, a takedown request for, for privacy reasons or GDPR or something, um, you don't necessarily want to see that change. Um, so if you are looking at, data versioning as sort of an extension of software versioning, it's not a good fit for that paradigm. Uh, and also it becomes very slow. So if you have, you know, a couple hundred gigabytes worth of data in your GitHub repo, and every time you update your GitHub repo, it's, it's sending it back and forth. Um, that can really slow things down, and if you get much bigger than that, um, it just won't work on GitHub at all. So GitHub does have a, um, a large file system, LFS, that uh, I have, have linked further down. Um, that's, you know, sort of handles this, but it's not gonna work for like a huge database. So if you, you can't just plug your, your data versioning into your code versioning uh, and expect it to work. Um, the other problems, one of them is that uh, it, it data big, right? Data takes a lot of disk space. Uh, and if you are storing multiple copies of files, uh, quickly you can end up requiring a lot of disk space. Uh, and this can get super expensive. So um, I think a lot of the time when people say don't version your data, they don't, what they're meaning is don't just keep saving copies of your large data files because that's gonna quickly get really inefficient. Um, and part of that inefficiency is you might be doing things that are redundant. Um, so if you have uh, a backup in place for your database, so let's say once a week you you make a, a backup of your database and I don't know, ship it to a warehouse. I know some people keep like physical backups of their data in different places. Um, and you also have, in addition to those backups, um, you're using version control for the scripts that you're using to extract data. You already have all the information you need to get a specific data set from a specific point in time. So you don't necessarily need to save that data set separately. Um, assuming, of course, that your scripts work and that you can get to the backup and that it's not correct, corrupted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't think, that you need to create a new data version every time you do something. Um, I do think that if you're gonna be training machine learning models, so if you're doing any sort of experimentation, uh, then personally, it makes me feel more comfortable if I version both the data and the code together, uh, because that's what you actually need to be able to re reproduce a specific machine learning model, right? Um, because the, the trained model that you have at the end has trained weights and they're trained based on both the data and the code. You, you need both of those together. And if you, I mean, uh, y'all are data scientists, you probably uh, know this and this is review for you, but you can't reproduce your results if you don't have versions of your data. Um, two questions one from steve and i'm gonna uh, deal with this a little bit later store clean data or data that needs cleaning that is a really good question and it's going to be super relevant on thursday uh when we talk about etl and a uh, question from chai mm, chayakachama Sorry, if, I, if I'm mispronouncing your name, that is 100% on you, uh, on me, rather not on you at all. Is it possible to have private data sets on Kaggle, like private read hub, repos on GitHub? It is. One second, let me turn the vacuum off.
Sorry, I'm back. That cannot have been uh, sonically pleasant. I forgot that we had him set to go off now. Um, yeah. So yes, you can have private data on Kaggle just like you can on uh, GitHub. Uh, Roomba, no, we have the like the off store brand uh, version of a Roomba. Roombas are expensive, y'all. Uh, but yeah, it is a it is a programmable robot vacuum. Uh, and Jainal says, how are the code versioning and the data versioning different? Whatever we're doing in a data, we are actually writing new code, so we can only do code versioning instead of data versioning. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little later as well. Uh, so I'm, if you uh, missed the first bit, I've got a little notepad and I'm saving questions for the end. Data versioning versus code versioning difference because I got really distracted last time uh, we did live streams for an event. Uh, and then there are some uh, people who are responding to earlier questions. I store raw and clean data separately with cleaning algorithms uh, stored where I store my code. Um, that is what I do as well. Uh, I tend to save each version of my data. Uh, and someone is bringing up a comment, usefulness of data versioning, this of data versioning. I'll come back to that later. Uh, okay, so the uh, the big biggest thing when you want to make sure that you can reproduce, sorry, the biggest reason why you wanna make sure that you're able to reproduce your early results, A, for experimentation. So if you're training different models uh, and you want to compare them to each other, you need to know the data that each was trained on. So you can do apples to apples, or at least know the difference between the apples that you put in the pie to begin with, I guess. Um, and also uh, it helps you show providence. So if you um, are working in an industry like, finance or um, I know at least in the US finance is heavily regulated and you need to show if you are training models um, why the models are making the recommendations that they are. So uh, I know it's still fairly rare for banks, for example, to use um, neural networks instead of, you know, rule based systems because rule based systems are um, uh, um, more easy to explain why things are happening in the way that they are. But if you were going to do um, a model, oh, sorry, I should have had more coffee. If you are gonna uh, have a model that is um, working with this sort of like highly regulated data um, and you can't show the data that you use to train your model, um, that's probably not good, right? Um, Sorry, show provenance. So where the data is coming from and what data you are using and also the qualities that the data has. So basically it allows you to do algorithmic auditing um, to explain why your model is getting the results it is, which is very easy with um, like linear regression uh, and is much less easy with things like, you know, recurrent neural networks. Uh, Ladbrook says interpretable. Yes, thank you. That is the, that is the thing that I meant. Okay. Um, so if you are interested more in learning more about reproducibility, um, I wrote a, a paper about it and you are welcome to read it, but also you don't have to read it because it is an academic paper. Um, I think the data versioning is appropriate in a subset of, um, cases. Um, so when you are making schema or metadata changes, so if you're adding or deleting columns or changing the units that information is stored in, or if you're moving between like CSV and JSON, um, I think it's absolutely necessary to save a version before and after, because if you're making a large change like that, it could end up breaking your models and you want to make sure that you uh, can pinpoint what those changes were. Um, and also, again, when you're doing experimental things. So on Kaggle, if you're in a competition, we have a specific, you know, training and test and validation set, um, and you you have access to that, and we've done that, and we sort of do the versioning for you. But if you're working in production and you have like a streaming data set, and you have, you know, data from one week for one model and a different week for another model, and then, oh, the first model was good, but we want to train it um, on new data, but we can't, you know, train it. We can't have a model that was trained on the same data as we trained that original 
original model on, so we can't really compare them to each other. And, you know, we had data from week two and data from week 14, and then we threw away the week two data and we can't get it back. Um, so in order to have a good experimentation and control for the variables in the data, you do want to save different versions. Uh, Ankush says data versioning is important to interact with our past work slash projects. Um, it's important to reproduce them. If you're doing something like creating charts, you may not need to have, uh, um, you know, the specific data set. It might be uh, sufficient to have the, the queries. Uh, Aston says that just seems like poor planning. Yes, versioning helps you get around poor planning. And I mean, it happens, right? You're trying a bunch of different things. You're um, playing around uh, and then, you know, you've trained 48 models and you want the first, the top three. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. I've definitely been experimenting and trying different things and sort of lost track of what I was doing. Um, so data versioning helps you get around that. Um, there are also some types, where, places where I, I don't think it's necessary to version your data. Again, it takes disk space. If you have large data space, it takes large data sets, it takes a lot of disk space. So if you're not using data to train models, if you're just doing it to make charts, I wouldn't necessarily save your, your data sets there and version them separately. Um, if it's big and very expensive, probably not a great idea to store it if you don't have the, um, um, you know, the budget for it. Uh, I would definitely always recommend versioning the scripts that you use to extract the data um, or the, the queries that you're using so that you have a copy of that. Uh, <laughs> And then if you're, again, if you're using um, a, a source control manager that's designed for code and not data, um, you do want to be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit cautious. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, question, how to do in production versioning control, it is needed. It'll really depend on your stack. Um, I do have some tooling examples that might be helpful for you um, that are designed to work in production. Uh, and Melon says, why not partition the data and keep a certain amount of weeks, months in hot storage and cold storage older data before deletion rather than appending the original data? Um, so the main reason why you might want to keep a separate set of data in your specific um, local storage is uh, so that you can version it along with your environment. So um, and I, I talk more about this in, um, in the paper. Uh, if you are doing something that relies on having, for example, a specific version of a CUDA driver or a specific containerization, if you have the code and the data uh, together in the container or some sort of you know, environment model, uh, then that is one reproducible unit that you can sort of wrap up and, and ship off. Um, but yes, if it's very large, then uh, it might be helpful to you know, keep some of it locally that's uh, just like the little bit that you need and, and send the rest to uh, long-term storage. And again, it's these are guidelines, right? That's the frustrating part. Like it's it's really going to depend on your your company's engineering infrastructure, um, your you know your software, your hardware, your budget for storage, um, what sort of you know machine you're working on and doing your work on, um, whether you're working locally or in the cloud. There's so many variables, but I want to give you some sort of tools and scaffolding to sit down and think about. Hmm, should I be versioning this data? Uh, Ms. Watchett says, why do we need to version data for metadata change? What if we just take the snapshot of data we are training on for versioning? Yeah, I'd say taking a snapshot, I would consider versioning. Yeah, as long as you, you are associating that snapshot with uh, information about when you were, you were um, uh, when you snapshotted it. There we go. Wow. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so... On Kaggle, we always version all of your data. So whenever you upload a data set, that's version one. Um, when you, you know, update that data set, we create new versions. Uh, and there's a good example of that here, if you just want to sort of see what it looks like. Uh, so this is a, a data set of uh, counter locations in Ottawa that sort of count whenever a bike goes over them. And you can see, if I scroll down in the right uh, thing, Whenever it is changed, we create a new version. Um, so we save the metadata changes and the data, sorry, we, we save changes in metadata and uh, new versions of the data separately, but we just record them all just so you can look back at them. Uh, 
Andrew says, one issue we have with all this is that our data needs to be accessible by our GDPR deletion request fulfillment require requests. Are you aware of any GDPR compliant integrations with source control data? Ooh, um, I was hoping to just sort of skirt around GDPR uh, rather than um, uh, getting too deep into it because I'm not a lawyer and I cannot give you legal advice. Um, and I would ask, if you are using a cloud service provider, I would ask your cloud service provider. Uh, Austin says, how big is too big for storage on Kaggle? I believe our current limit is 20 gigabytes per data set, I believe. Uh, we updated occasionally, and in the past, at least, it has updated up, so to larger size data sets, but yeah. Uh, so if you're working locally, um, if you can't put it on the cloud, or if you can't put it on Kaggle, and there's some data that you shouldn't put on Kaggle, um, like please don't put health data uh, on Kaggle that's covered under HIPAA, we can't handle it right now. Um, question, can we delete versions? I believe you cannot delete specific versions at this point. There are a lot of tools that are, you know, being created around this problem of versioning data for machine learning and data science specifically. Uh, two of the popular ones are DVC, so Data Version Control and Pachyderm, and these are both links and you can uh, check it out. And they are pretty similar in some ways, so they are not complete sentences. Uh, um, I'll fix that, sorry. Um, the biggest similarity between them is that they're designed to work into a git based workflow and sort of like plug into existing git tool chains. Um, so if you're already using source control, they're designed sort of layer on top of it. Uh, and they're also focusing on not just versioning the data, but versioning the data, the code and trained models together. So um, once you have your, your version data and you also have your version code, you also need a way to link them. Um, so, and uh, somebody asked earlier about data versioning versus code versioning. So it is important to do both, but it's also important to say, um, this is model 1.5. We trained it using uh, code version two and also data version three. Um, and all of those together are what make you have a reproducible unit. Uh, Raymond says, assuming data sets are somehow marked with country codes, GDPR could be navigated uh, by sharding data on MongoDB. Yeah, that could work. Uh, again, I am not a lawyer. Uh, question, how can versioning be used as an advantage in using Kaggle for competitions? So the biggest uh, advantage of versioning, especially if you're doing something like um, jackknifing, um, is that you can go back and find the model that you trained earlier and you can compare your experiments to each other um, in a way that's more um, uh, parallel to each other. Uh, Raymond says, Mongo is not the only solution, just the one I am most familiar with. Uh, question, is there any material on this topic or live stream only? There is, there is a uh, notebook and I thought that I put the uh, link in the description and I did not, but the notebook is called, uh, apparently it's called Kernel 46, that one. Um, I'll link it in the description. Uh, there's a bug right now with um, something that I'm, I'm testing for the, the engineering team. So I will, I will get on that. Okay. The differences between these tools, so data versioning, beta version control, and Pachyderm, um, DVC is only really available as a command line tool. There is a tool to um, vi visualize the dependencies between the data and code in the models, um, but there's no way to interact with them visually as far as I know. They're, it's under active development, so that could change. Um, and uh, Pachyderm does have a full graphical user interface. It's very slick. Um, Perhaps this is not a surprise, but given the sort of GUI availability, DVC is open source, it's free. Um, I believe it's FOSS. I know there's sort of like political things about saying that, but um, Pachyderm does have an open source version, but it is a company and the way that they make money is that they sell the enterprise version of their, their product for doing sort of like pipeline management and version control. Um, Pachyderm is fully built on containers, so uh, specifically Docker and Kubernetes. So if you're already using Docker and Kubernetes, it might be a little bit easier. Um, 
DVC has the option to use containers, but they're not the default. Uh, so if you are, for whatever reason, sort of choosing not to use containers in your workflow, DVC might be a better choice for you for that reason. If you're already using containers, Packager might be a better choice. Uh, and there's also a bunch of other things. These are just sort of ones that I've heard about. Um, they're in various sources of development. Some of them are in alpha. Some of them are maybe not under active development. So I would definitely do a little bit of research before committing. Uh, but data, data IQ, I guess, data IQ, uh, data lab, datmo, git LFS, uh, QRI, it's pronounced query and quilt. Um, I think Quilt's probably the one of these that I've heard the most about, uh, but Pachyderm and DVC are currently the um, uh, most commonly used that I've come across. Uh, and I have a, uh, a little exercise that we can, um, you can talk about in the comments and I'll be uh, monitoring the, the comments on the notebook through the day uh, once I <laughs> finish my coffee. Um, so feel free to, to jump in there. All right. So let's create a data set from a GitHub file. Um, I Let's find a GitHub file first. Let's go to GitHub. I had uh, a data set, but then I uploaded it as a test and then I was like, oh no, I can't upload the same data set twice because you'll get yelled at. Um, we do, uh, uh, we check the data sets that have already been uploaded so people don't upload 80 versions of the same data set uh, and you can instead use something that somebody else has already uploaded and save yourself some time so um what is the lexicon what are the the there's lexicons that are like um for emotional words is it an emotional lexicon maybe so um Emotion analysis, sentiment lexicon, emotion words. Mm. I'm trying to remember what it's called. So there's a specific set of data sets that you use for more fine grained um, analysis than just sentiment analysis. So it's like, uh, rather than just like, you know, happy or sad, we can say, oh, they're angry, they're upset, they're happy, they're excited, um, they're, you know, other other emotions. Oh, what's it called? Um, emotional lexicon analysis. Um, emotion lexicon. Emotion intensity lexicon. Emotional lexicon. Oh, okay, so it might be emotional lexicon. Lexicon. There we go. <laughs> Marking color, text and sentiment lexicon, Twitter sentiment analysis master. Oh, here we go, emotional lexicon. So this is a Jupyter notebook. Does it also have data in it? Requirements, download resources.py. So it looks like it might not. Mm. Oh, here we go. AFIN lexicon someone has suggested in chat. AFIN 11, tuple reader. Oh, right. Um, all of GitHub. All right. Uh, list of English words rated for valence, sentiment analysis, lexicon based sentiment analysis using AFIN dictionary. I want the actual dictionary. Let's see if it's in here. JavaScript, JavaScript, htm. Let's check the code instead of repos, maybe. Desktop. Oh, that's not going to help us. Um, well. Let's see. Um, maybe we'll just add something for. Uh, so I just want to add something that's going to be like uh, helpful. Persian lexicon. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This will work. Um, emotion word association lexicon for Persian sentiment analysis. So that's um, Farsi. So let's add this data set. Um, so this is a uh, GitHub repo. It is open source. Uh, all I need, sorry, it is, um, what's the word that I'm looking for here? Public, the repo is public. 
Uh, Many says a lot of repos in that GitHub list are actually redirects to external websites. Is that what is meant to be imported? Uh, no, sorry. I do mean for uh, us to do repos today. Tomorrow we're going to be importing data sets from just a URL endpoint. Uh, and Austin has recommended the Public Utility Data Liberation Project, um, which would also probably be a good place to look for stuff. But I'm happy with this. We don't have a whole lot of, of farcy uh, stuff on Kaggle. So uh, to create a new data set, scroll, 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 uh, you can go to kaggle.com slash datasets. Wait for that to load. Uh, and create a new data set. Uh, and then to create a GitHub data set, we click on the GitHub link here, and then we enter the URL. Um, and it will, uh, if it's a correct URL, populate the list of files that are going to be imported. Uh, and this was the NRC Persian lexicon. Persian lexicon. Um, and actually, Translation English. Hmm. Uh, does this say what license it's under? I may not actually be able to upload this. Oh, okay. Uh, let's just find a sentiment lexicon that is actually under a license that we can uh, we do. Uh, Ranji says, is Kaggle provides the data set or do we have to upload a new data set in Kaggle? So for this one, um, I am thinking that you are going to upload a data set um, that you have found. Let's see. Uh, Seder and Entenmann, uh, lexicon rule-based sentiment analysis tool. Does it have actual data in it? Emoji test.txt. What's in here? Da, 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 da. Oh, okay. That seems very helpful, actually. That's something that I would use in my work. Uh, and it is under the MIT license. All right, we are good to go. So we can upload this guy. Um, and this is a uh, lexicon and rule-based sentiment analysis tool. And it's got a nice emoji uh, helper as well. So let's do that instead. V A D E R sent sentiment. Let's spell it correctly, uh, and we'll create it. And you will notice uh, down here where it says private. By default, data sets are um, started. Uh, by default, data sets are uploaded privately, and then you can uh, choose to make them public. So let's create this. Um, Someone said, is the video blurry for anyone else? Yes, okay, so that might be because of um, uh, my internet restrictions. It should be clearer once the uh, recording is uploaded, fingers crossed. Uh, oh, uh, someone asked if I could paste the co URL in the comments. I don't think I can, unfortunately. Um, because I am not on uh, logged into the um, Kaggle YouTube right now. Um, but the uh, URL is github.com slash cjhutto slash vader sentiment, all one word. All right, so uh, now we've created our GitHub data set. One thing that we might want to do is decide whether or not we want to do versioning here. So, and this will work with any public GitHub repo. It doesn't have to be this specific one. So if you've been watching the um, uh, my Friday live coding, I've been working on a transformer and I actually imported uh, a GitHub repo that had code for transformers um, in like as a data set and then use the code from that data set. And it does not work with private data sets yet. Uh, from GitHub. So once I go to the data set, I have clicked on the settings tab up here, uh, and it is under the MIT license. So let's find that one. Oh, we don't have a uh, MIT license in our little, in our little dropdown. Uh, it is specified in the description though. Uh, so if we would prefer not to version the data set, so if it's very large um, or for whatever reason, um, you can choose to have the latest version only so we won't store previous versions. And um, we can also set it up to update weekly or monthly. So Gus, just go and if, uh, you know, find what's on GitHub at that point in time and then upload it as a new version. Um, so let's say 
is this under active development? Let me check that. When was the last commit? Ooh, more, 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 more. Uh, so it looks like it's not under super active development. So the last update was around two months ago. Um, but, you know, it's possible that it might be additionally updated over time. And I want to make sure that uh, uh, the version that I have here is going to be the uh, most recent one. So let's, um, let's say that we want this to update monthly. Uh, and then we can, oh, we can make our subtitle long enough, enough data set from GitHub. Is that 20 characters? No. Uh, data set and code for sentiment analysis from GitHub. There we go. And then save changes. Um, so it's versioned and it's also going to be updated. Um, the never option means that it's never going to go and fetch a new version automatically. So yes, it is for, uh, for manual updating. Correct. Austin. Uh, how to translate the lexicon to other languages. So one thing that some people have done is to have gone through, um, you know, translation APIs like, um, Google translate, or I think Bing has a translation API. Uh, I'm sure Amazon does. I've just never used it. Um, the um, best way is to try and find something that's been done by hand. Um, so this one is English. Um, you can search. I've actually uploaded on Kaggle quite a few. Uh, oh, I think I've uploaded a lot of stop word lists, actually, um, rather than... Doop, doop, doop. Hmm. Yeah, so I've uploaded a couple of uh, stop word lists for, for more different languages. Um, but yeah, finding finding different language uh, NLP resources can sometimes be um, very frustrating. Uh, Austin says, I'm not sure why you would not have an update option when you have selected a versioning. So the one reason why you might not want to update a data set is if it's something like the King James Bible, that's not going to change, right? It's a static data set. Um, and you, you know, maybe you might find a typo and you might want to update it once and like get rid of that, that problem with the file, but probably you're not going to want to update, you know, a static data model every, uh, every month, if that makes sense. Uh, good questions. So that is pretty much all of the content that I wanted to cover. And I did answer questions during it. I, I, I know, I just I can't not answer questions. Um, and there were a couple of questions I didn't get to that I did write down. So one was about um, storing clean data in versions or storing the raw data. So I would, if it's not uh, size prohibitive, I would actually saw, uh, save both. So in uh, Jupyter, that's not how you spell it. JupyterCon. Um, in it's linked in the in the notebook as well, but in the um, reproducible research uh, workshop, I talked about about JupyterCon. I actually talked about every single stage that I would specifically version. So uh, I would save the raw dating raw data, the code you use to pre-process it, the pre-process data, um, the modeling code, the model itself, and then specifically for um, um, research code that's going to go into a paper, I would save out all the figure generation code and the figures themselves. So that's my, you know, personal uh, stance on it. Um, WL says, what about surveys conducted once a year at most? I mean, I would update those once a year. I, so the, the thing that we've actually done at Kaggle, because we have our, our data science and machine learning survey, um, we create a different data set for each year because they're pretty substantially different. Um, and it's not that we are adding new data, it's that it's completely new data in each version. Um, so if it is something where you're going to have different surveys each year, excuse me, uh, you might want to create new data sets for each survey. Yep. Um, Magic says, are there any disadvantages to setting your data set to update automatically? Yeah, so the biggest disadvantage is that you might have like just a quadrillion versions. Uh, so a lot of our data sets that we update um, by Kaggle, 
Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. It'll have, so if it's a data set that Kaggle is updating, we'll have a little uh, maintained by Kaggle badge and you will see, and we've set up uh, like the internal infrastructure a little bit differently, but if you scroll down on these, you can see that there are a lot of versions uh, of the, the automated updating and we actually do it every day for these data sets. Um, so the, the downside is that it might be harder to find the specific version that you want. Uh, CJ says, Rachel, APIs have a limitation of characters when you want to translate huge files. Is there any way to do so? Oh, uh, that's going to really depend on the API. Um, yeah, so if you're thinking about something like those are the, the data API I'm most familiar with is probably the Twitter API. Well, actually, it might be the Kaggle API at this point. Um, but yeah, you do have to work within the, um, the confines of your specific tooling. Um, you can zip files. That makes them a little bit, um, a little bit easier to uh, uh, transmit. Uh, whether or not your API accepts zip files, question mark. I would not save binaries uh, necessarily, so something like a pickle or an R data file, um, just because if you are doing something like versioning where you want to be able to go back and and rework it and maybe um, run different code on the same version, uh, pickles and R data files and any binary file is going to be very um, brittle to changes, especially subversion changes in any of the packages that you use to interact with it. Um, so you might end up with a file that you just can never read in again. So that's unfortunate. Uh, Austin said, why would you version daily version versus using a REST API in Kaggle situation that is? So one reason why you might want to version daily is so that you can go back and look at the other ones. Um, also, you can you can use the, the versioned data to um, evaluate models. Um, yeah, it's it's for it's for reproducibility. We want uh, Kaggle to be helpful for researchers who would need to have like the specific date and time. Um, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Kushaga says, I think versioning can be used to update weights and machine le learning model as well as new labeled data getting added in data set. Versioning can be used to update weights. Oh, so you mean saving different versions of the model? I think so. Uh, Ashay says, is there any way to bookmark versions among data sets maintained by Kaggle? Yes. Uh, so every version on Kaggle specifically is associated with a unique URL, which is just the data set URL slash version slash the version number. Um, so there's always a fixed endpoint that you can point to, which is really helpful if you're doing, especially for, for research code. Um, it's good to be able to point to the specific version of code that you used uh, to, to create your model or your figures so other people can reproduce your work. Um, Austin says, oh, right, assuming the prior data wasn't changed. Yeah, it's, 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 it is um, an insurance policy against the data changing, basically. Uh, and then there was a question, usefulness of data versioning. So, and I believe that was, uh, somebody mentioned that it was on the notebook. So let's go back to the notebook. Load, load, load. Oh, let's go down to the comments. Uh, are based on a Git repository? Okay, I'll, I'll go through and answer some of these. Um, none of them are GitHub repos. Yeah, so the, the repository I pointed you towards is actually a automatically updated. So some of them are GitHub repos, but also apparently a lot of them aren't. Uh, oh, and some people are talking about the um, things. Let's see. I'm trying to find the, the comment that someone mentioned. I think it was, uh, well, unless your purpose is merely educational, your conclusions and decision about model versioning should always be over averages of a significant amount of runs performed over each one of the versions. Each run should be with random seeds and different data partitions, e.g. cross-validation to guarantee minimal impact for this randomness. Keeping track of each and every data partition slash seed is irrelevant once you get the info of the average and variance to each model. Hmm. So, yeah, this is sort of a, a slightly different school of thought. So one thing is that this works, this sort of model works where you're, you're doing sort of a lot of cross validation instead of uh, training on a specific model. Um, it works better the bigger your data set is. So if you have a relatively small data set, um, 
cross-validation will get you some benefits. Um, it will not necessarily, um, it, it's, it will not necessarily outperform not cross-validating. Uh, I am also thinking about um, instances where you're doing a lot of experimentation and you do want to be able to go back to the exact model that you trained. Um, Oh, uh, someone said, I can't find the decision tree image in your research best practices notebook. Could you link us? Um, it is in this notebook. Oh, hmm. That's no good, huh? Where's the notebook? All right, I might need to, uh, I might need to clear my cache. It's probably because I, I clicked on something while it was loading. Um, Someone said, inside the repo, reproducible research best practices, enter reproducible research best practices, JupyterCon, I, I, Pi, NB. Uh, Rajani says, can you please show how to use the existing data set version in Kaggle? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so let's find a data set. Sorry, I know I'm a little bit all over the place, but we're done with the content. So I feel like this is sort of like our chit chat time. And if people want to, um, uh, bow out here please feel free uh let's find oh nope that's version one oops nope 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 go back i can tell there's only one version um so i can tell there's only one version because it says version one here so i'm gonna find something uh here we go okay so this is version two if i wanted to um use version one Scroll, scroll, scroll up. Um, there is a bug, and I don't remember all of the details of it. Um, you should be able to use the data. Oh, I'm trying to remember. Sorry. Um, if you wrote a if you wrote a um i'll get back to you on that um leave a leave a comment on the notebook and i will i will get back to you on that it's something about when you created the data set of when you created the note the kernel on the data set and i need to go back and read the bugs so that i make sure that i'm telling you the right information mm. Um, Nick says, Pachyderm is great for version control of the data and being able to instantly point the trained model to its data set. Yeah, I, uh, I like Pachyderm. Uh, I also like DVC. I don't know, they're, they're both good options. I was saying something and I got just like, completely by side. Oh, right, cross-validation. So the, the sort of like huge cross-validation, really trying to capture the randomness strategy, um, can be very effective with large data sets, um, can help you sort of capture the, the envelope of variance a little bit better. Um, the problems with it come in the situations, again, when you need to be able to reproduce stuff and also when you need to talk about sort of provenance um, and what exact data you trained on and how well it represents sort of the population as a whole. So the idea is that through jackknifing, you get a better estimate of the population mean given your sample mean, because you're basically sort of re-subsampling um, from the, um, the, the draw that you have. Um, sorry, this is, this, is, this is going way back to my statistics classes. Um, but if you are really doing it truly randomly, um, then it can be very hard to say ex specifically what data points led to what decision. And in some places that is fine. And in some places that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, and also again, for things that you want to reproduce. So my background is in research and if you are publishing code and you can't, uh, if you're publishing a model and you can't reproduce that model, that's, um, considered to be less than ideal. Let's put it that way. All right, let me scroll up and see if I can uh, get some of the questions I, I missed because I was definitely focusing on other things. Okay, so some people are having uh, no problems with the, the blur. So it might uh, be down to um, bandwidth. 
Do, 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 do. Uh, are you using Windows for development? Do containers work as well in Linux? Um, I don't use Windows for development, actually. So I, I stream from my uh, home computer and my non-admin account. Um, I actually only work in Linux uh, in like terms of job stuff. So yes, containers work very well in Linux. Uh, da, da, da. Scroll up. Oh, there was a question and then I sort of, uh, I scrolled up past it. It was about um, things in real time and someone wanted an example. Uh, uh, this is Akshay. When you say comparing models built in different timestamps, could you quote a real world, a real application where this need arises? Ultimately, anyone wants to build models which cover older and newer data. Uh, oh, so a really good example of this is if there is a trend over time. So, um, and the, the trend, uh, switches. So there's, oh, there's a specific test for this, and I'm trying to remember what it is. But basically, if you if you have a time series and you're modeling that time series, let's say you own a pet store and you want to know how many dog toys to buy, um, and you are building a model based on historical sales of dog toys, and you see, well, the population of my city is getting bigger, so there's sort of like a general increase in the number of dog toys, and also people will uh, buy more toys around Christmas and buy more toys around summer when they go outside to play with their dogs or something like that. So you, you have a model that captures those things. Um, um, and you've been you've been building your model with your data, and then there's a step change. Um, so let's say I'm trying to think what would give a step change to a pet store. Let's say a animal shelter opens up right next to the pet store, and now people are adopting animals and they're coming in and um, buying a lot of toys right after they adopt their their dogs. Um, so. In addition to the step change of there just being a lot more people, then you have a different pattern because when people adopt dogs is not necessarily going to pattern well when with the when with when the general population buys dog toys, right? So if you have a model, even if you're only looking at things like seasonality um, that you would expect to be not necessarily um, super affected by this this step change and just having a lot more people with dogs buying toys. Um, if you're not capturing the seasonality of both the adoption and also general dog toys, you're going to, you know, have your stock levels off. I hope that was a good example, but sort of any sort of demand forecasting um, in particular would would fall prey to this or um, uh, or if you're doing like some sort of image recognition, if uh, um, you have your training images on like, let's say ImageNet, and then you have a bunch of user photos that they're they're asking you to tag, um, and your users are all using Instagram filters, right? That's gonna be like a, a, a change. And if you have your original data and you have the data that you're working with now, you can um, sort of prioritize your, uh, your transfer learning or your data augmentation strategies. Um, but if you don't necessarily know the, the types of systematic differences between the data that you originally trained your model on and the data that you're looking at now, um, then it's just harder. I mean, you can do it, but it's going to take more compute and probably more time. Hopefully that makes sense and was helpful. Scroll down to the bottom. Um, someone says, uh, T die chest, uh, a priori algorithm and association rules, chow test. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Pachyderm is great. So I'm, I'm, uh, I was scrolling up to look at questions and I'm scrolling back down to make sure that I'm not missing anybody. Uh, as AI becomes used more in society, reproducibility will learn, loom even larger. Um, I would not be shocked if in the future there was more uh, legislation around model training and data retention. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Again, not a lawyer, but you know, it's, it's good to think about things that might happen in the future. Uh, do you know how to get R to work on Raspberry Pi? Sean Larson says, no. Thank you for asking. I, I respect that you... Uh, I appreciate that you think of me as an R person, but I am uh, not a Raspberry Pi person, unfortunately. Um, and, oh, um, someone on Twitch asked, which data model does Kaggle use to store uh, data slash competitions? So we do really rigorous uh, data versioning. I can't talk too much about like our specific workflow, but um, yes, it is important to us. Um, and someone asked, how do I make a heat map? I would search for, scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, 
we're getting a little bit off topic now. So this might be my, my last question. Uh, so if you search for the tag tutorial, oop, and then you search for the thing that you want a tutorial of, you will find uh, a relevant kernel, hopefully. Heat map might actually be one word. That might be why I only had uh, one example here. But this is a, so this is an R and it looks like it's a pretty good tutorial. I'm seeing lots of, uh, lots of comments, which is also always a good sign. Yep, so if you have just sort of like a how do I do blah in data science question, uh, that would be my, my recommendation. Okay, so it's been about an hour, which is, I think, plenty of time to talk about uh, data versioning. Um, hopefully this was helpful for you guys. I'm, I'm interested to hear your, um, your thoughts. I'll be reading the um, comments on the notebook, uh, and I will uh, post the notebook link in the um, description of this stream as well. Uh, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Same, uh, same tat time, same tat channel, same tatman, that channel. Anyway, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Um, and yeah, my back is feeling much better. Thank you for asking. Uh, and we will talk about URL endpoints. Uh, and I will, I'll, I'll go through and find a, a better example of URL endpoints, data sets at URL endpoints, because they're a little bit harder to find. And um, we will also talk about data validation. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.